It's a funny story. Earlier today, I was chatting with my fellow countryman, Andrew Wilson, who some of you may know. And he looked at the brochure for today and he said, is this just a massive misprint? Because it says Jesus through the eyes of witnesses instead of Jesus through the eyes of women. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is looking at Jesus through the eyes of women and also witnesses and confronting Jesus as we go. So this is going to be like a kind of mishmash up if you have read um, either Confronting Jesus or Jesus Through the Eyes of Women. Um, but most importantly, I hope that all of us would just be fixing our eyes on Jesus a little bit more clearly in the next few minutes, especially me. Two months ago, I had to fly back to England because I had the privilege of speaking at my grandpa's funeral. My grandpa grew up in the north of England in a very poor family. And it was a Catholic family, so he was the eldest of seven children. He left school when he was 14 in order to get a job to help his parents provide for the other kids. And my grandpa was a wonderful storyteller. And one of the stories that he liked to tell through the generations was of a time before he left school when he was in a swim meet at his little school. And he was swimming the breaststroke. Now, his last name was McPoland, and his nickname all his life was Mac. So his friends were standing on the banks of the swimming pool, and they were shouting, come on, Mac! Come on, Mac! But he was swimming the breaststroke. So what he heard was, come back! Come back! And he stopped swimming and turned around and started swimming back to the beginning, thinking there must have been a full start. My grandpa had this beautiful sort of Northern England accent, which you have to fully appreciate to really get the, the force of that story, and I would never quite dare to replicate. And I, I told this story as part of my eulogy at my grandpa's funeral. And afterwards, one of his surviving siblings, his younger sister Eunice, came up to me, and she said, I remember the day when that story happened. She said, Peter was actually winning the race until he thought that he was being called back. Now, my grandpa, in all the years of telling that story, had never mentioned that he was winning the race. He just told it as this funny story. But here I was, confronted with an eyewitness of his early life. And as I talked with her, I realized that I just spent the last few hours with a host of eyewitnesses of my grandpa's life. Some, like my great aunt Eunice, had known my grandpa since before not only I was born, but before my mother was born. Some, like my mother and her two sisters, had grown up with my grandpa as their dad. Some, like my grandma, had known him as Max since they were both 16 when they first met, and since they married in their early 20s. And some, like me, were his grandchildren, or even his great-grandchildren, who had memories of our grandfather from the latter part of his life. So we open the four Gospels in our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We are confronted with the testimony of many witnesses of the first century Jewish rabbi known at the time of Jesus of Nazareth. This afternoon, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what we learn from these eyewitnesses about Jesus. And there are four things that I, I want to focus on. The first is that the Gospels were actually written within the lifetimes of eyewitnesses. Second, that the Gospels give us their individual names. Third, that the Gospels show us intentional differences. And fourth, that the Gospels make incredible claims. And as we look at these four things, we need to have in the back of our minds what John tells us toward the end of his Gospel, that all these things have been written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. So first, the Gospels were written within the lifetimes of the witnesses. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the skeptical scholar Bart Ehrman um, and his illustration to help us think about what the Gospels in our Bibles are. He tells a story, and some other skeptical um, scholars and, and writers have told this story as well, 
of saying it's a little bit like the telephone game. You know when kids sit down in a circle, and the first one whispers a message to the second one, and the second one whispers a message to the third one, and so the message goes around the group until the last kid says what they think they heard, and everybody laughs at how different it was. For generations, people have talked about the Gospels as if they were the product of an oral tradition, something like that. And how, of course, the Gospels we have in our Bibles are just sort of scrambled versions of whatever the original eyewitnesses thought that they saw or heard. But in actual fact, if, if we look at the datings for the four Gospels in our Bibles, even according to scholars who aren't coming from a Christian perspective, the general consensus that Mark's Gospel was written between 35 and 45 years after the events that it records, that John was most likely written about 60 years after the events of Jesus' um, ministry, death, and resurrection, and that Matthew and Luke fall somewhere in between. Now, when I talked to my great aunt Eunice and heard her memories of that moment in her brother's life, she was recalling something from over 70 years ago. And she was remembering it like it was yesterday. It's about twice as long ago as the time lag between when Jesus died on the cross and when Mark's gospel was written down, and longer than the time lag between when Jesus died on the cross and when John was likely written down. Now, many people would say, listen, I don't remember what I had for breakfast last Tuesday. How could people possibly remember with accuracy things that happened decades ago? Now, of course, none of us remember everything that happens in our lives. I, for instance, do not know what I had for breakfast last Tuesday. But all of us remember the conversations and the events that changed our lives. And meeting Jesus was a life-changing event. What's more, rather than it being like the telephone game where one person heard about Jesus and just passed it on to the next person, next person, next person, and so on around, instead we know that Jesus had many witnesses of his life and ministry, of his miracles, of his death, of his burial, of his resurrection. We learn in the Gospels about his 12 chosen apostles, sometimes called the disciples, 12 Jewish men chosen to picture God's new kingdom, like the 12 tribes of Israel, but recapitulated. But it's also clear in the Gospels that there were many other disciples who traveled with Jesus, who listened to what he said, who watched what he did. And in particular, we hear about a number of women who were Jesus' disciples in the fullest sense. Luke tells us at the beginning of um, Luke chapter 8, that when Jesus went on a preaching tour, a number of people went with him, including the 12, and many women who had been healed from various diseases and sicknesses. And he tells us in particular about three women. First, he mentions Mary Magdalene, from whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. Then he mentions Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. And third, he mentions a woman named Susanna, so do you see how here we're hearing about individual names of eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry? Not only the 12 disciples, a.k.a. the apostles, but also named witnesses among the women who traveled with Jesus. And if you look at Luke's gospel actually from the beginning to the end, you'll see women playing particularly significant witnessing roles. But let's home in for a minute on these three whom Jesus names, Mary Magdalene, Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna. Now Mary Magdalene has gone on to become by far Jesus' most famous female disciple because of the role that she played in witnessing Jesus' resurrection. She had by far the most common name among Jewish women of her time and place. If you read through the Gospels and look out for the Marys, you will find Marys everywhere you look. So this Mary was identified by the place she came from, Mary Magdalene. Next, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. Now, I don't know about you, but for years of reading through the Gospels, I think I just sort of breezed past this particular verse. I had no curiosity about Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. Then I read an incredible book by a man named Richard Borkham, who, if you're ever interested to know more about Jesus' 
through the eyes of eyewitnesses. I highly commend Richard Borkham to you. And he points out that we can actually learn quite a lot about this second woman from the description that Luke gives us. So she has the, one of the most common names of Jewish women of her time and place, not quite as common as Mary, but certainly there were many Joannas, so she needed more identifiers. And her husband, Chusa, being Herod's household manager, would have been quite a significant figure in Herod's court. So this is a high-status, wealthy woman who has left the court to travel around the countryside with Jesus on his preaching tour. This would have been quite shocking, quite extraordinary. And third, we hear about Susanna, and we've just given her name, a less common name for Jewish women of that time. Now, why is Luke telling us about three women? He said there are a bunch of women. He could have just left it at that. Well, in Jewish legal context, having three witnesses for any situation was, was seen as the gold standard. And so Luke is particularly pointing us to these three women as witnesses of Jesus' ministry. And if you scroll back to the beginning of Luke's gospel, you'll find that you encounter three female witnesses there as well. So most famously, of course, we have Mary, another Mary, Jesus' mother. And we're dependent on her testimony to know the conversation she had with the angel Gabriel and the extraordinary things that Gabriel told her about what her son would be like and the role that he was going to play. But then we have Mary meeting with her relative Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. And we see Elizabeth being filled by the Holy Spirit and recognizing who Jesus is even when he's in Mary's womb. Who am I, says Elizabeth, that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And famously, at that moment, we hear Mary bursting out with this extraordinary hymn of praise to God for everything that he's going to do, this massive revolution that he is going to work through her son, Jesus. So that's two female witnesses. And then, as we follow Jesus to the temple, when his mother and Joseph take him to be dedicated, There we meet Anna from the tribe of Asher, a prophetess. Again, just a very brief description, but a very significant one. If you think about it, chronologically, Anna is the first person in the Bible to be identified specifically as a prophet since the Old Testament prophets. She's from the the tribe of Asher, one of the northern tribes, and she is continually in the temple. She's a very elderly lady, and she speaks about the redemption of Israel that's going to be wrought through Jesus. So at the beginning of Jesus' life, according to Luke's account, we have these, these three female witnesses, and right in the middle, we have these three named witnesses as well. Now, Again, I've learned so much from just reading Richard Borkham, so this may be very familiar for those who've already um, had the the pleasure of reading Richard Borkham. But one of the things that he points out is that ancient histories like this were, were very much dependent on eyewitness testimony. And when people are named in these documents, it's kind of like saying, this person can vouch for this message. You know, if you don't believe me, go and ask Mary Magdalene. And that explains why, as we read through the Gospels, we will find that there are some named figures and some unnamed ones. And sometimes we sort of wonder why somebody's been named. Um, For instance, when Simon of Cyrene is, is hauled in to carry the cross for Jesus, and the comment is made that he is the father of Rufus and Alexander. We read that and we think, well, okay, who are Rufus and Alexander and what do they have to do with anything? Well, most likely, these two sons of, of Simon are sort of carrying his testimony and sharing his story with anyone he wanted to hear. Because you see, after Jesus' extraordinary life, after his death, after his resurrection, this team of eyewitnesses went around telling everybody they knew the stories about Jesus. And actually, It's likely that the Gospels were written down 
precisely because these eyewitnesses were, were starting to die out. And it was really important to preserve their testimony so that people a century, two centuries, three centuries, even 2,000 years later like us, would be able to read the stories about Jesus and know them with accuracy. Written well within the lifetime of these eyewitnesses, and written with individual names given, guaranteeing their stories. A little bit like my great aunt Eunice, who gave me that extra insight into a story that I'd whole, heard for generations in our family, but where I'd never heard the detail that she was able to bring. Now, we, we might conclude from this that, okay, if I'm reading through the Gospels and I come to a named person, that means they're really important, and the unnamed people are, are not so important. It would be a reasonable hypothesis to have. But actually, if you read through the Gospels, that doesn't stand up. This is an extraordinary story that Luke tells us about a time when Jesus was invited to dinner by a man who was identified as Simon the Pharisee. Now, usually, as you're reading through the Gospels, the Pharisees are usually not impressed with Jesus and not inviting him around for dinner and usually complaining about who he's having dinner with. But on this one occasion, a Pharisee named Simon has invited Jesus around for dinner. And while they're having dinner, Luke tells us that a woman of the city who was a sinner, comes in. No name, a woman who is notoriously sinful. Now, you might at first think, okay, well, Luke is clearly making Simon the Pharisee out to be more important than this anonymous woman who is known only for her sin, right? This woman walks in, and she starts crying, weeping on Jesus' feet, washing them with her tears, wiping them with her hair, pouring ointment upon them. And what's Simon's reaction? He says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. If Jesus really knew about this sinful woman's past, he wouldn't want anything to do with her, and yet Jesus is letting this woman touch his feet and pour out her love on him. In Simon's mind, this means that Jesus cannot even be a prophet sent by God. But then Jesus tells a story which shames Simon and lifts this woman up as an example of love. So let's not be confused. Yes, we are told the names of specific eyewitnesses in the Gospels that guarantee the authentic testimony that you and I today, 2,000 years later, have access to actual eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, ministry, miracles, death, and resurrection. But let's not fall into the trap of thinking that those anonymous people in the gospel stories don't matter. Because often, when we look through their eyes, we see Jesus for who he really is. I have a five-year-old who is about this tall, and often he is wanting me to look at things through his eyes. On Sunday, last Sunday, um, he was, I was holding him in my arms, and he was noticing one of his friends up on the balcony behind, and he literally grabbed my head and like forcibly turned my head around so that I would be looking at this person too. It was quite painful, I don't recommend it. Other times, he'll be looking at something and he'll make me get down on my knees so that I can look up from his perspective through his eyes to see what's happening. And until I get down on my knees, I can't actually see the angle that he is asking me to see. If you read through the Gospels, what you'll often find is that the people who are standing up in front of Jesus kind of like this cannot see who Jesus is. Whereas the people who are down on their knees, who have thrown themselves down in front of Jesus, who are maybe pouring their tears on his feet and wiping them with their hair, those are the people who can see Jesus for who he really is. We see Jesus most clearly through the eyes of those people who are down on their knees. So in the Gospels, we are encountering testimony that was written well within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. We're hearing the individual names of people who can guarantee it, and that becomes particularly significant 
when we come to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because famously, the Gospels point us to the testimony of women when it comes to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But we also, if we read through all four Gospels together, we notice that there are differences between the Gospel accounts. So what are we to make of that? You know, some would say, well, if there are differences between the Gospels, especially when they're telling the same story and they maybe have different details, then that shows that these aren't really authentic eyewitness accounts, or at least that they are not reliable eyewitness accounts. But that brings us to our third point, which is that the Gospels actually offer us intentional differences. I don't know about you, I'm a big uh, fan of The Lord of the Rings. I, I read the books growing up. I've read them to my children multiple times. And I absolutely love the films that were generated around The Lord of the Rings. But as a Lord of the Rings book enthusiast, there are certainly moments when we're watching the films when we sort of feel sad about the things that have been left out, right? <laughs> because the Lord of the Rings films are trying to capture these massive, these three sort of massive books telling this extraordinary story and boil them down into three films that even though they're very long films, I think, you know, up to three hours each one, uh, if you watch the extended edition, there are so many things that have to be cut out. And if you think about the process that the gospel authors went through when they sat down to write their accounts of Jesus' life, they were trying to condense three years of public ministry, in some cases starting even at the very beginning of Jesus' life on earth, thousands of potential stories that they could have told from the many eyewitnesses that they were consulting. They were trying to cram that all down into books that can be read in the same length that it takes you and me to sit down and, and watch a feature film. You know, if you think about it, Jesus probably healed hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people in the course of his public ministry. And the Gospels tell us a handful of those stories. Jesus preached hundreds, possibly thousands of, of sermons in the course of his ministry. And the Gospels preserve a handful of those for us. So we have to recognize the ways in which the Gospel authors are, are needing to edit and scrunch down to tell us the stories that, that they most particularly want us to hear in the way that they most particularly want us to hear them. And sometimes that, that means that they will tell us different stories. And sometimes that means that they will tell us the same stories in different ways. One example of this is, is one of my favorite stories in all of the Gospels. It's, it's a time when Jesus is asked to come and heal a 12-year-old girl who is very, very sick. Her father is a synagogue ruler. Again, we're sort of surprised that a synagogue ruler is actually coming to Jesus for help rather than trying to stand up against Jesus. But, but this time, a synagogue ruler named Jairus comes and kneels before Jesus and pleads with him to come and heal his daughter who is very sick. And Jesus starts immediately to go with Jairus to heal this little girl. But while he's on his way, a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and who had spent all her money on doctors and hadn't got better but only worse, thinks to herself, if I could just touch his garment, I would be healed. Now, it's hard for us, I think, to, to get our minds around the full magnitude of her situation. So she's, she's been bleeding for the last 12 years. She's actually been ceremonially unclean for that whole time. And if she comes and touches Jesus, she'd be making him ceremonially unclean. She's taking a big risk here. And it seems like her plan is, she's just gonna kind of sneak up on Jesus in the crowd, touch him, get healed, and then melt away back into the crowd. And the first part of the plan goes really well. She sneaks up on Jesus, she touches his clothes, and she's immediately healed. But there's a problem. Jesus stops and he says, um, 
who touched me? He feels the power go out of him. And his disciples say, well, what are you talking about? You're in the middle of a crowd. Everybody's touching you. How can you ask who's touching me? Jesus says, no, 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 Some, somebody, somebody touched me. He starts looking around for this woman. She comes trembling and falls in front of Jesus and confesses what she's done. She's evidently expecting Jesus to rebuke her. You know, what did she think she was doing, touching him in her condition? But Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. She's the only person in the Gospels whom Jesus calls daughter. Of course she has the right to touch him. She's family. And it feels like a happy ending in that moment. But then messages come from the synagogue ruler's house and they say, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Jesus says to Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe. And he goes with Jairus to his house he sends everybody away except for Peter, James, and John, and Jairus, and the, and the little girl's mother. And then he goes to this little 12-year-old girl, and he says to her in their shared mother tongue of Aramaic, Talitha kumi, I say to you, little girl, get up. He raises this little girl to life. It's a beautiful story, not least because of the parallel between the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years and the little girl who'd been alive for only 12 years. Jesus bringing life and healing back to both of them. But if you read the accounts from Matthew's Gospel and from Mark's Gospel together, you'll find some significant differences. Interestingly, whereas Mark is, is by far the shortest of the Gospels, so often Mark is sort of scrunching things more, even more than the other gospel authors. In this instance, it's Matthew who's scrunched things. Because in Matthew's account, from the first, the message is that the little girl is dead. Not that she was sick, but that she is dead. Whereas in, in Mark's account, we get this, the, the different scenes along the way. As first she's sick, then the woman with the issue of blood comes and touches Jesus, and then the message comes that she's dead. Now again, as we look at these two accounts side by side, we don't need to say, well, Matthew was wrong or, or Mark was wrong. Because in fact, Matthew is, is condensing the story for his own particular purposes. If we look over at, at John's Gospel, we'll often find that John is telling additional stories, different stories from the stories that typically told in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we might think, you know, why is that? Some people will say, well, John has written so much later. Maybe John is, you know, making stuff up at this point. This is 60 years after these things have happened. But in actual fact, there's good reason to think that John had access to Mark's account, or certainly heard many of, of the stories. And so there are times when he's telling other stories to fill the accounts of Jesus' life out. And there are times when he's even telling the same story, but with significant details added. Another wonderful story in the Gospels. I feel like I probably shouldn't, it's, all the stories in the Gospels are wonderful, let me be clear. <laughs> but as I think about each one, I think, oh, that's such a wonderful story. It's the wonderful story of when Jesus, not long before he is arrested and executed, and gloriously raised from the dead. When a, a woman comes and pours perfume on him. And in, in this case, it's his disciples who, who criticize this woman. They say, look, this was a really expensive perfume, an ointment. It could have been sold for a lot of money. That money could have been given to the poor. What a waste to pour it out on Jesus like she has. And Jesus defends this woman she says, he says, oh no, she's done a beautiful thing for me. Wherever the gospel is, is preached, her story will be told. Jesus says that he, she has prepared his body for burial. But it's not until John's account of this that we find out the woman's name. It turns out this was Mary of Bethany, the sister of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. And it's not until John's Gospel 
that we're given a particular name of the disciple who criticized her. It's Judas Iscariot, who John tells us had been stealing from the money bag. He wasn't really concerned for the poor. He was concerned for his own gain. And in that moment, we see that Mary is the disciple who Judas Iscariot really ought to have been, pouring out her love on Jesus, recognizing that he is worth everything, not thinking, how can I gain from him, but recognizing how much Jesus had done for her. So we see these, I would say, intentional differences that, that don't need to alarm us as we read through the scriptures, but should invite us to think, what is it that this gospel author is, is wanting me to focus on? What are they especially trying to draw out of this story? How are they using this story to show me that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And so by believing, I may have life in his name. And as we read through all four of the gospel accounts, we will find that they are making incredible claims. Now, this may seem like a, an obvious thing to point out, but the reality is that the historical evidence for the Gospels is so strong that if they weren't making completely extraordinary, incredible, miraculous claims, they would be generally agreed to just be accounts of, of history, things that obviously happen. The reason they are so controversial today, the reason there are many today who, who don't believe everything that the Gospels tell us, is because of the sheer magnitude of the claims that they are making about Jesus of Nazareth. And there are so many stories in the Gospels that we could go to to see that they are making incredible claims. But I'm going to pick up on just a couple. Now, of course, there is the absolutely incredible claim that this first century Jewish rabbi who died on a cross was then raised to new life physically on the third day. Now, as I mentioned, the, all the Gospels point us to the fact that, that women were the witnesses um, of the, the crucifixion. We see women as the witnesses of Jesus' burial. And then we see women as the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And once more, I, I, I love what John does with the eyewitness accounts that he has of Jesus' resurrection. Because we know there was a group of women who went on that first Sunday morning with the intention of anointing Jesus' body, properly preparing him for burial. But in John's account, he sort of tunes out the other voices for just a minute, and he focuses in on the one Mary Magdalene. Now, if you think about it, as you go about your normal life, and as you tell stories and report things to, to other people, you and I actually do that quite frequently ourselves as well. We will edit out people in a story that we're telling if they're sort of extraneous to our purposes. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I had a play date with a dear friend of mine named Julie. She has four children, and I have three children. And we spend most of our time when we're together at play dates where it's sort of our combined um, posse. And that night, I came back to tell my husband, Brian, I said, oh, I saw Julie by herself for the first time in ages today. And he said, where are all the kids? <laughs> I said, oh, they were there as well, but, but they were irrelevant from my perspective because I was getting to have an adult conversation with Julie by herself for the first time in ages. And it's a little bit like that, what, what John does in his account of, of Jesus' resurrection. Because he focuses in on this one witness, Mary Magdalene. And interestingly, he emphasizes the fact that Mary was weeping. Now, it's not striking to us in our, with our 21st century um, ideas and sensibilities that women were the first witnesses of the resurrection because in our minds, the testimony of a woman would be just as good as the testimony of a man. In the first century cultural context that the Gospels were written into, that wouldn't have been the case at all. Actually, it was kind of embarrassing um, in terms of the credibility of the, the Gospel accounts of the resurrection that it was women who were witnessing the resurrection. In particular, women were thought of as being unreliable and overly emotional when it came to religious matters. But, but John, rather than being embarrassed by this, seems to sort of lean into it. <laughs> he tells us repeatedly that like Mary's, Mary's weeping. In fact, it seems like she's weeping so much that when she encounters Jesus in the flesh, 
She doesn't even at first recognize who he is. She thinks that he's the gardener. Until he speaks her most common of all Jewish names, Mary. And then she realizes who he is. And she goes back and she reports to the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. It's a very simple message, but an incredibly profound one. In that moment, as he records Mary's words, John is inviting us to see Jesus through her eyes. To see her as an eyewitness, in particular, of Jesus' resurrection. I have seen the Lord. And the extraordinary claim of the resurrection is, is filled out in John's Gospel by an earlier story that we're told about another Mary. It's possibly my favorite story in all of the Gospels. And I know I sound like the sort of person who all the stories in the Gospels are their favorite, but truly, this might be my favorite story in all of the Gospels. It's, it's recorded for us in John chapter 11. And it's that, that famous time when Mary and Martha of Bethany, two of Jesus' close friends and disciples, send Jesus the message because their brother Lazarus is very sick. The message is this, Lord, the one you love is sick. Notice, not Lazarus, not our brother, but the one you love is sick. Then John emphasizes for us that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then he tells us, that when Jesus got their message, he didn't come. It doesn't make any sense, right? You know, you'd think it would make sense if John had told us Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and so when he got Mary and Martha's message, he dropped everything and came at once. Or it would make sense if John told us Jesus didn't really care about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and he was busy with some other stuff, and so he just, you know, put off coming. But no, John tells us very specifically that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus and that Jesus very deliberately waited until Lazarus was dead and then he came. Martha came out to meet him and she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Do you, you hear this woman's faith? brother is dead and buried, and even now she thinks that Jesus can save him. Jesus gives her a theological answer. Your brother will rise again. And many Jews of Jesus' day believed that there would be a, a resurrection of God's people at the end of time. But that wasn't why Mary and Martha had called for Jesus. Martha responds, I, I know, Lord, he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But you can almost hear her thinking, what about now, Jesus? What about now? Why won't you help me now? And then Jesus looks into this grieving woman's eyes and he says some of the most extraordinary, profound, and incredible words ever spoken on this planet. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha thinks that her greatest need is for Jesus to raise her brother from the dead. But Jesus stands in front of her and says, no, her greatest need is Jesus himself. Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you hear the incredible claim that Jesus is making there? Jesus is saying that if you are alive today and you do not believe in him, you are in fact dead. And if you believe in him, then even when you die, you will become gloriously alive. Martha responds, 
Yes, Lord, I know that you're the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And then Mary comes out. She says the same words, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus goes with these women to their brother's tomb. And then we read another extraordinary claim. We read that Jesus wept. Now some of the people who are watching see this and they say, look how much he loved Lazarus. But other people say, wait a minute, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have stopped this man from dying? And the answer is yes. Jesus has deliberately let Lazarus die and yet he weeps with Mary and with Martha. What, what do we learn about Jesus as we look at him through their eyes in this moment? We learn that it is not the case that our suffering doesn't matter to God. Our suffering brings tears to the eyes of the Son of God. Even though he has allowed it, and even though as we see as the story progresses, he is one day gonna wipe every tear from our eyes. Jesus meets with us in our suffering. But if that was where the story ended, it wouldn't be quite the incredible claim that it is. Because in that story, we don't just see Jesus saying extraordinary things about himself, and we don't just see Jesus weeping with these two grieving women. We also see Jesus saying, roll the stone away from Lazarus's tomb, and then calling out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And we see this man who is dead come out with his grave clothes still on him. When we meet Jesus in the Gospels, we are being confronted with the one person who can call you and me out of our graves. A few years ago, I was driving past the local cemetery with my daughters. And one of my little girls said to me, Mommy, is that where all the dead bodies are? I said, yes. She said, oh, that's gross. I said, don't feel too superior because you're going to be one of them one day. <laughs> but I said, if you have put your trust in Jesus, then long after you are dead and buried and rotting in your grave, Jesus will call out to you and he will say, Miranda, come out. Eliza, come out and you will walk out of your grave to everlasting life with him. This is the incredible claim of the Gospels. That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who made us in the first place. He is the one who sees every moment of our lives. He's the one who knows how many hairs there are on our heads. He's the one who holds us as we weep. And he is the one, if we have put our trust in him, who will raise us from the dead because he stood in our place and took our penalty for us. These are the incredible claims of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we can believe the eyewitness testimony that they give us, then they're claims that have to change everything about our lives today. They're not claims that we can just put on the fringes of our lives. They're claims that must shake us to the core. I had the privilege a few months ago of getting to know um, a woman named Molly Worthen, who is a professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. And as a professional historian, she has been on a really interesting journey in the last year or so, because she came to the point of realizing that she believed that Jesus had, in fact, been raised from the dead. And she realizes that if that is true, then it must change absolutely everything. She's put her trust in Jesus because she has come to the conclusion that yes, he not only claimed that he was the resurrection and the life, but that he also proved that he is the resurrection and the life by rising to new life. Two months ago, 
I stood next to my grandpa's graveside as his body was lowered into his grave. My hope for him is that one day he would hear the voice of the Son of God saying to him, come on, Mac, and that he will get up out of his grave and walk into resurrection life with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, whatever happens in this life today, however much you fail, however lonely you feel, however useless your life may seem, all that's gonna matter is that one day, Jesus will call your name, just like he called to Lazarus. Lazarus, come out, and you will get up out of your grave and walk into his arms forevermore. Thank you.